Howdy folks, and welcome back to Elite Dangerous with the Mighty Jingles, and this is the big one. I'm going to Colonia. Got myself a brand new Anaconda. It's not quite set up for maximum possible jump range because I want to actually do things along the way. I figure if you're going to be doing a 22,000 light year journey, it's going to take a couple of days anyway. So why not stop and smell the roses along the way? If I see anything particularly interesting, I'd like to have the option at least of stopping to investigate it. And if I'd stripped the ship down to the absolute bare minimum, well, stopping to investigate interesting stuff along the way just really wouldn't be an option. So here it is, my first jump, starting at the Shinrata Desra system from the Jameson Memorial Orbital Starport. And it's going to be the first of many. Now if you're wondering why everything suddenly changed colour, it was because shortly after I posted on Twitter that I was actually embarking on this journey, um, a very, very kind subscriber, goes by the name of Tobias, emailed me a preferences.xml file for Elite Dangerous that changes, well, the way the game works. And I kind of liked it, but after a while it was starting to cause some performance issues, so I went back to the original colour scheme. Right after I messed around with the game's graphical settings, by a complete coincidence, I ran into one of the navigational hazards that you're extremely likely to encounter if you should embark upon this journey. A patch of brown dwarf stars, a couple of hundred light years across. Now if you're thinking to yourself, well why is that such a big deal Jingles? You can't fuel scoop from brown dwarf stars. However, I kind of anticipated running into this kind of problem, which is why I packed an additional fuel tank on board my Anaconda, which gives me a jump endurance of around about 550 light years. More than enough to get through this patch of brown dwarfs to the other side, to a star that I can actually top up my fuel tanks from. Because there's nothing more embarrassing <laughs> than getting stuck halfway to Colonia and having to call in the fuel rats. The fuel rats, by the way, are amazing. I've never needed to actually call upon their services yet, and I really didn't want to have to call on them for the very first time stuck out of fuel halfway between the bubble and Colonia. It's not that they wouldn't come out to rescue me, they absolutely would, but it would be extremely embarrassing. <laughs> you see, this is just what the fuel rats do. If you find yourself stuck anywhere in the galaxy, out of fuel, contact the fuel rats, and sooner or later, depending where you are, it might be later, but a fuel rat will turn up to top up your fuel tanks and send you along your merry way. That's just what they do. In fact, the game developers have even honoured them. You may have noticed that when you dock at a space station, there are various different holographic adverts uh, lining the mail slot on the way in. Now, most of these adverts are for, well, the Federation, the Empire, the manufacturers of the various different ships that you fly, or for uh, tourist hotspots, like, for example, the Voyager probes in the Sol system. But occasionally you'll also see an advert for the fuel rats, which the game developers put in in recognition of the service that they provide for the players. So that's really cool. What is not, however, really cool... Ah, here we go. Made it through. Time to start topping up my fuel tanks. But what is not really cool is that certain unscrupulous players have been known to contact the fuel rats, claiming that they need to be rescued, and then when their rescuer turns up, uh, they kill them which is an incredible dick move, but, well, I guess some people just want to watch the world burn. This, however, has never prevented the fuel rats from doing their level best to get to you, wherever it is that you may be, if you happen to need their services. So the fuel rats are awesome, and hopefully I'm never going to need their services. Packing an additional fuel tank like this is just one way of making sure that you're never going to run out of fuel. But you can also tell your nav computer to only plot a route via the stars that you're actually capable of fueling from. Uh, there's an acronym for it, KGB FOAM. So you can fuel from star classes K, G, B, F, O, A and M. KGB FOAM. Just remember that acronym. Make sure that you filter your route so it includes only these kind of star systems and you will never find yourself in a system where you're not able to fuel scoop. Here, for example, I'm currently sucking on fuel from a nice G-class star. If I didn't have that extra fuel tank, bearing in mind that my next fueling stop is an M-class red dwarf, 
325 light years away with nothing but brown dwarves between me and it, I would almost certainly run out of fuel along the way. Well, couldn't you just plot a route around them? Yep, you absolutely could. In the same way that I could plot a route that would only take me through fuel stars, but either option is going to add hundreds. In fact, on a journey of this size, thousands of unnecessary light years to your route. Plus, I want to see what's in all of those star systems, with the carbon stars and the brown dwarfs and so on and so on. I'm not just jumping from system to system as fast as possible. If I come across a system that has an abnormally large number of uh, planets in it, for example, I'm going to stop and I'm going to map it all. Uh, because that data is going to be very, very valuable when I get to the other end. On the other hand, this is a very, very long journey in the first place, and I don't really want to deliberately make it any longer than it needs to be, so I will be taking some shortcuts. One of the other options that you can tick on your route planner while calculating your journey is to take advantage of frameshift drive boosts. Yes, we're going to be taking a trip along the Neutron Superhighway. Neutron stars and white dwarfs, like this neutron star here, emit bursts of supercharged particles from their poles thanks to the speed at which they're spinning. And if you have a fuel scoop, and you won't be doing this journey without a fuel scoop, if you fly into those jet cones, it'll supercharge your frameshift drive. If you do it in a neutron star, by 300%. Neutron stars are way better for this than white dwarves are, not just because white dwarves only boost your frameshift drive by 50%, but white dwarves are a damn sight bigger than neutron stars and a lot easier to, well, fuck it up by flying into the star's exclusion zone. There we go. Throttle up, get out of the jet cone, and we've made it. So now, instead of doing a 41 light year jump to the next system, thanks to using the jet cone boost from the neutron star in this system, we're doing a 157 light year jump to the next system. And you do that often enough, and the savings add up. And sometimes, if you're lucky, and the stars have all lined up in the correct position, well, let's just wait and see. So I'm jumping from one system with a neutron star to another system 157 light years away. And here we go. And when we pop out at the other end, there's going to be a very pleasant surprise waiting for me. Any second now, we should drop out of hyperspace. And yet another neutron star. So I can scoop from this one again. Well, not this one again, but I can scoop again from... you know what I mean. <laughs> Two neutron star jumps in a row. So providing I don't screw this up beyond all recognition, and just manage to avoid the neutron star's exclusion zone, and neutron stars are tiny, it's not difficult to avoid its exclusion zone, I can supercharge my frameshift drive again, and do more than 300 light years in just a couple of minutes. Come on, there it is, throttle up, get out of the jet cone. My next jump is going to be 166 light years, so that's well over 300 light years in the course of just two jumps. Not bad. It's barely a drop in the ocean, of course. <laughs> I'm doing 22,000 light years in total. So shaving off a couple of hundred light years here and there isn't really making that much of a difference overall. But it feels like it's making a difference, and that'll do. Because a journey of this length is as much a psychological as it is a physical endurance test. And it is saving me time. I mean, I'm doing in two jumps what would have normally taken seven or eight. One word of advice, however. If you're taking advantage of neutron stars to shorten your journey time, you absolutely must fit your ship with an automated field maintenance unit. This is a piece of equipment that conducts repairs on the modules of your ship. And the reason you're going to need one is because if you're conducting neutron star jumps like this, each jump damages your frameshift drive. It's a 1% hit after every neutron star jump. So you can see that after four neutron star jumps, my drive is down to 96% efficiency. Now at 96%, I don't have to worry about anything. My drive is going to be fine. Apparently your drive will be fine, all the way down to 80% efficiency, but if it drops below 80%, 
there's an increasing chance that your drive is just going to fail when you try to spool it up. Now even then, it's not critical, it's just a real time waster because you have to go through the frameshift drive cooldown before you can try to jump again. But if your drive gets below 70% efficiency, as well as failing to jump when you ask it to, there's also a chance that it will also drop you out of supercruise and into real space. And if that happens when you're trying to supercharge your drive through the jet cone of a neutron star or a white dwarf star, you are dead. So don't let your drive drop below 80% efficiency if you can possibly avoid it. And the only way to fix the damage is to either dock at a station, and there are some stations scattered along the route between the bubble and Colonia. They call it the Colonia Connection Highway. 20 extremely isolated outposts of civilization, orbitals and surface settlements, set up specifically to aid travelers making the trip from the bubble to Colonia. But there are only 20 of them, which means they're spaced out slightly more than a thousand light years apart. Nevertheless, they are there if you run into trouble and you have to make repairs that you can't conduct yourself. Otherwise, use an automated field maintenance unit. It's an absolute lifesaver if you are journeying using the Neutron Superhighway and taking advantage of that frameshift drive boost. Now, I did mention that I wanted to do some mapping along the way, particularly if I came across any star systems that had an abnormally large number of orbital bodies. And this one, um, whose name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, contains 72 planets. Now, I'm not going to make you sit here in real time as I scan and map every planetary body in this system. All you need to know is that I am the first person to ever set eyes on this star system. Not a single orbital body in this system, not even the star, has ever been visited before. Which means that I'm going to get my name on the star charts as the first person to discover everything in this system. And all of this data is going to be worth millions when I finally make it to Colonia. Just from this one system alone, and it's not the only system I scanned amongst the hundreds that I'm going to be jumping through on the way to my destination. At the end of the first day, I'm 8,000 light years into my journey. I've still got about 14,000 light years to go, but already things are starting to look very, very different out there. You know when you look up into the night sky on a cloudless night and hopefully somewhere where there isn't too much light pollution and you can see the plane of the galaxy spread out in a ribbon of stars right across the middle of the night sky. I'm willing to bet it never looked like this. That is fantastic. See how much thicker the stars are? I mean I'm visibly closer to galactic centre. I'm still probably 15,000 light years away from galactic centre but the stars are starting to become a lot more closely packed together. Now, this is nothing compared to galactic centre itself of course where you can barely move without bumping into stars and I do plan to visit the galactic centre not least of which because of Sagittarius A star the supermassive black hole at the centre of the galaxy that's on the to-do list. I just have to get to Colonia first. But there was some amazing eye candy to view along the way to Colonia. In fact, that's what we're going to be doing for the next minute. I'm going to shut up and just let you enjoy the view. Sure is pretty, isn't it? But I didn't come out here for the view. No, the spectacular sights are just an added bonus. And you don't have to come all the way out here to see things worth looking at. There are plenty of spectacular places to visit. 
much, much closer to home than this. And in fact, that's going to be the subject of a future video. But for now, the end is in sight. The tier system, home of the engineer, Marsha Hicks, one of the reasons I'm out here in the first place, over 22,000 light years away from the Shinrata Desra system, where I have my home base, is now a mere 29 light years away. Civilization, hot showers, and coffee are at the other end of this jump. It took me three days, but I finally got there. Nowadays, of course, you can just hitch a ride in a fleet carrier that can cover 500 light years in a single jump. And in fact, a lot of fleet carrier captains are doing exactly that are taking passengers from the bubble to Colonia and back. In fact, our very own Grumpa Salty, admin of the Salt Mines Discord server, is currently in the process of doing exactly this for a whole bunch of other players on the uh, Discord server. I, however, will always have the satisfaction of knowing that I did it the hard way. That's right, I am a galactic hipster. <laughs> I did it the old-fashioned way before it was cool. All I know right now is that it's taken me three days to get here, and just look at how densely packed those stars are. I mean, if I hadn't told you how close we were to Galactic Center, you'd know just by looking out of the window. Check that out. Now that's great, of course, but I, I really couldn't care less at the moment. That's the first orbital station I have seen in three days of travel. I just, I just want to avail myself of the facilities and have a hot shower and a cup of joe. Of the engineers that I need to see while I'm out here, which is the whole reason that I came out here in the first place, Petra Almanova, Mel Brandon, Etienne Dawn, and Marsha Hicks. Marsha Hicks is located in this system. All I require is 10 tons of osmium to give her, and I did mine that 10 tons of osmium before I embarked on this journey. I just may or may not have accidentally sold it at a commodity market back in the bubble um, before. Okay, yeah, I did. But then again, do I really want to be hauling an extra 10 tonnes of mass around on a journey of this length when I can just mine it out here? So that's what I'm going to be doing next. Right after I've had a shower and a cup of coffee, because we have made it to Bolden's Enterprise in the tier system, 22,000 light years from home. So for now at least, I'm done. Hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.